All right, so let's get started, please. So w welcome to Thursday. We're very happy to have Pavel Kovtun from Victoria, the other, vi the other Victoria, to tell us about hydrodynamics beyond hydrodynamics. Thanks, Pavel. Uh, thank you, Gerald. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming this morning. Um, uh, thank you, um, the organizers of the workshop, for uh, putting this together, for inviting me to speak about some of the things I've been thinking about um, lately. This talk is supposed to be pedagogical, non-technical, accessible, wide audience, colloquium style. If you have questions, feel free to interrupt me, uh, ask <coughs> whatever does not make sense. Um, so clearly there are many interesting structures that arise in the context of so-called hydrodynamics as um, we have heard at this workshop. So I am a physicist and this talk is going to be about uh, the big picture of hydrodynamics from a physics perspective, more precisely from a perspective of like, formal theoretical physics. Um, basically the themes I want to touch on is what hydrodynamics is, how it breaks down and uh, how we fix it when it might uh, uh, break down. So what is hydrodynamics? <coughs> Basically, it's a set of partial differential equations that tell you how stuff flows. So what is stuff? Stuff can be water, air, coal, atomic cloud, matter in the early universe, electron fluid in a solid. Um, <coughs> and let's say you don't know much about the subject and you try to learn about the subject from textbooks as a student. So as a student, you open a typical textbook and you will see um, you know, derivations, approximations, applications, all of this is going to be mixed together. The full set of equations that uh, are the equations of hydrodynamics is probably going to appear somewhere on page 300 or 400 in the book, and before that is going to be covered with boundary value problems, various flows, but not. Um, so especially when you're a student, if you try to learn about um, vector calculus, differential equations at the same time, it can be quite confusing. Okay, when you start learning about this. But the big picture is in fact quite simple. So fundamentally, hydrodynamics is a macroscopic theory of things that cannot disappear. That is, they are conserved. <coughs> and the way conservation laws are normally written down is like this. So time derivative of some conserved density is equal to negative divergence of the flux of that same conserved density and that Quantity can be energy, momentum, number of particles, other things that uh, happen to be relevant for your physical system. So in order to convert those conservation laws into some uh, usable uh, differential equations, you make a huge leap of faith. You say, well, let me treat those conservation laws as classical differential equations, and um, you treat these as a non-function, the density and the flux, and then you make this huge assumption, the classical assumption, you assume that you can express the flux as a function of the density, okay? And if that works, then you have an equation only for the density, and then you can solve that equation. Uh, more generally, you don't necessarily, if you don't work with the densities for some reasons, such as symmetry reasons, uh, you can talk about some useful quantities, such as temperature, or the velocity of the fluid, and then you express both your density and the flux in terms of those useful quantities, which are called gamma, and then you have partial differential equations for gamma that you can solve. So here is an example, simple example how this works. Uh, let's take your conserved quantity to be the energy. Uh, let's take the useful quantity to be temperature. Then you express the density of energy as a function of temperature. That's something given by the equation of state. Uh, then you also have to express the flux as a function of temperature. So flux is a vector. Uh, temperature is a scalar. The simplest way to make a vector out of a scalar is to take the gradient. You stick a coefficient out in front. You call it heat conductivity. And then you substitute these two things into, uh, into the conservation law and you have a diffusion equation for temperature. Okay, so it makes sense. <coughs> so here is a summary of uh, um, how I think about hydrodynamics. It's uh, conservation laws plus constitutive relations. And uh, clearly, as... Uh, uh, we have seen on the previous slide, simple example of diffusion. These constitutive relations can also involve gradients, not just the useful quantities, but also derivatives of those useful quantities. 
And this procedure, meaning conservation laws and constitutive relations, is the same whether your fundamental constituents, classical, quantum relativistic, non-relativistic, normal fluid, superfluid, magnetic fields, not magnetic fields, chiral symmetry, no chiral symmetry, it's pretty much the big picture is exactly the same. <coughs> so if you take those constitutive relations and by hand sort of throw away all the terms that have derivatives, you have what people call perfect fluids, the partial differential equations are called Euler equations. If you keep terms with uh, up to one derivative, so you get what people call viscous fluid, the partial differential equations in this case are Navier Stokes equations. If you keep terms with uh, two derivatives, you get what people call second order fluids, the differential equations are so called Burnett equations, and you can keep going um, uh, if you want to. So, this is sort of the bird's eye view uh, of the theory, and um, as a physicist, uh, I have to ask myself these questions. So every theory in physics is wrong, or more precisely, every theory in physics is only approximately correct because it's limited by its domain of applicability. And whenever we write down any equations that attempt to describe physical phenomena, we have to answer these questions. Do the equations make sense? Can we improve the equations to capture more uh, physical phenomena? And what kind of phenomena are beyond our equations? And my talk is going to be, is to going to have three parts, so one part for uh, each of those questions. Okay, so I'll start with the first part. Do fluid mechanical equations even make sense? So you may think it's a strange question to ask. Surely fluid mechanical equations have been around for centuries. Um, they do make sense. So I want to focus uh, on one particular question that is uh, relativity. So what I want to do, I want to, I want to think about how to unify relativity and dissipation in the context of fluid dynamics. Okay, so how do we do this? Can we just follow our nose and generalize normal, well-known non-relativistic Navier-Stokes equations to fluids uh, that um, secretly obey some kind of relativistic symmetry? And um, you may think this is quite straightforward to do. People have done this many years ago, and indeed, people have. The answers can be found in classic textbook. So if you're a student, you want to learn about these things from classic textbooks, you can open some classic textbooks, say Landau Lifshitz, um, uh, fluid dynamics, it has a section on relativistic fluid dynamics, it has a section on relativistic Navier-Stokes equations, you open the, that section and you see there are some equations. Um, now, you can open another classic textbook, say Gravitation and Cosmology by Weinberg, it also has a section on relativistic fluid dynamics. It also has a section on relativistic Navier-Stokes equations. You open that section, you find some partial differential equations. And if you put these two books side by side, you realize the equations are completely different. <laughs> so um, what's happening? <coughs> so the equations are different. Um, so as a student, you may be puzzled, but as a student, you're often taught to shut up and calculate, which is a very useful strategy in many examples. And um, you can do this, you can just shut up and calculate and just solve those equations, not in full generality, of course, but work out the simplest example that you can think of as a student, meaning solve for linearized perturbations of the thermal equilibrium state. Meaning fluid just sits there and does nothing, you introduce an infinitesimal perturbation, linearize your equations, see what happens. So what will happen is that those equations are different, but they predict those things. They predict the thermal equilibrium does not exist, meaning if a fluid just sits there, you flick it a little bit, it's going to develop an instability. The instability will develop on a time scale, which is microscopic, not macroscopic, but microscopic time scale. And moreover, the equations predict that things propagate faster than light. And so your theory is supposed to be relativistic. So sad but true, the equations that you find in classic textbook make no physical sense. And this has led to the belief that Navier-Stokes equations cannot be unified with relativity and have to be um, abandoned in the relativistic settings. And what happened is that uh, other exotic theories have been proposed in uh, the 1970s to replace the Navier-Stokes, and the field has moved on. So pretty much when you see people talking about relativistic hydrodynamics, showing you various simulations of relativistic hydrodynamics, flows, you know, quadrilon plasma, they do not solve Navier-Stokes. Okay. So they solve what I call other exotic theories, which is a way to like throw in other stuff into Navier-Stokes, throw in other coefficients, other fields, and you know, somehow mess with the equations. And after that, you get something that, you, that is solvable. And so that's what people solve. And that's, that's what people will call uh, relativistic uh, hydrodynamics. But if you press them, they will tell you, well, we are not solving Navier-Stokes, of course. Uh, 
So, but as a student, you still have this question. Uh, so why do the theories of Landau, Lifshitz, and Eckert, why do they differ uh, in the first places? So it would be nice to understand. So to understand why, I want to talk a little bit about temperature. So I'll give you a second to uh, read this uh, cartoon. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So this tells you temperature is important. Temperature is one of the, one of the variables. In um, <coughs> uh, fluid dynamics, you cannot uh, get rid of temperature, especially in the context of relativistic fluids, when all this stuff about incompressibility is totally irrelevant, uh, when uh, you, know, you have to talk about energy and momentum, and of course temperature is, is paramount uh, when you talk about energy. So temperature is, Im is important, and so what is temperature? So temperature is something that is only unambiguously defined in equilibrium, and by definition, temperature is the quantity that is measured by a thermometer. So what I have here, I have here a picture of uh, a box of my stuff, and I have uh, stuff that sits here in the box, and the stuff is in some equilibrium state. And the state of my matter, this orange stuff is matter, is the same. Now I have two different thermometers, the green thermometer and the red thermometer, and if the stuff is in the same equilibrium state, the thermometers will show the same temperature, even though the thermometers may be different. But if I calibrate them properly, they will show the same temperature, right? You know. um, now, let me take the same two thermometers and place them in identical states, but the states are now not equilibrium, okay? Then the same two thermometers that used to show the same temperature in equilibrium will now show a different temperature out of equilibrium. So why is this? Well, you know very, very well why this happens from real life. You take two different thermometers, two different designs of thermometers, place them outside your window, temperature drops very quickly, maybe like it does, <laughs> like it did today, and maybe one of these thermometers takes longer to adjust to the outside temperature changes, so the gauge will move slower. And maybe the shape of the blob is slightly different, and if the wind blows, the shape of the blob is going to matter. Uh, you can say, well, these effects are small, and indeed, the effects are small. But remember, we want to understand gradients, we want to understand dissipation, and when you talk about gradients, well, this gradient effects perhaps something that you have to worry about. Um, so what this tells you is that there is an arbitrariness in what you mean by quote-unquote fluid temperature, because the choice of thermometer is a convention. Okay, it's up to you what kind of thermometer you choose to use. There is exactly the same arbitrariness as to what you mean by fluid velocity, because your choice of velocimeter is a convention. There's simply, not, there's simply no such thing as quote unquote fluid velocity. It's up to you to choose what you mean by fluid velocity. Your fluid velocity can correspond to a flow of particles. That's one definition. Your fluid velocity can correspond to a flow of energy. That's another definition. Your fluid velocity can correspond to a flow of entropy. That's another definition. You can take some weird combination of those things, call it your own fluid velocity. So there are as many notions of fluid velocity as there are people who choose to introduce their own convention as to what they mean by quote unquote fluid velocity, fluid temperature, whatnot. And of course, what happened is that Lando Lifshitz's version of Navier Stokes, they use one convention, and Eckhart's version of Navier Stokes use another convention. And there is simply no such thing as quote unquote the Navier Stokes until you specify your arbitrarily chosen conventions, ch chosen convention. The Navier Stokes that you see in textbook, they use some implicit convention. They may not tell you that's what they do, but there is some convention choice that's happening uh, behind the scenes. Um, so what's important is that different conventions give rise to different mathematically inequivalent Navier Stokes equations. So the conventions have real consequences. And physically speaking, this is because the Navier-Stokes equations only give you a crude approximation of uh, the real fluid, and the difference between the convention is hidden in the crudeness of that uh, approximation. So Landau, Lifshitz, and Eckert, they adopt different conventions for Navier-Stokes. Both conventions are bad, and both um, give rise to nonsensical predictions. So if you're a physicist, you want to use an analogy with quantum field theory and then the choices of Landau, Lifshitz, and Eckert, the analogous to adopting ultraviolet regulators uh, for your effective theory, which, which uh, violate unitarity. <coughs> and uh, from, a point of, from the point of view of writing the derivative, writing down the derivative expansion for the constitutive relations, the difference in these conventions is basically how you truncate your derivative expansion. <coughs> um, so what's, what exactly is wrong with those classic approaches? So here is one example of uh, 
what is, what is wrong. So both uh, Lando, Lifshitz, and Eckhart, they define temperature by, uh, by this relation. They say that the exact non-equilibrium density of energy is equal to epsilon of T, where this function is given by the equilibrium equation of state. Okay, now what is fundamental? So in physics, energy is fundamental. Energy density is fundamental. It's calculable in microscopic physical, physical theories. It has a definition. Temperature is just a proxy for what energy does. And in this definition of uh, temperature, uh, this tells you that as the local density of energy changes, the thermometer adjusts its temperature instantaneously. There is no lag. The thermometer re re reacts instantaneously. And if you work out the details of what happens in the relativistic Navier-Stokes, it turns out that uh, such an instantaneous reaction of your thermometer is one reason why relativity is violated and why you have superluminal propagation in uh, relativistic fluid dynamics. <coughs> now, you can ask this question. Why don't you choose a thermometer or velocimeter that does not react instantaneously and actually respects relativity? So in other words, can you just adopt a sensible convention? And uh, surprisingly enough, this is not something that people have asked until a few years ago. And it turns out that, yes, you can. Uh, so it is indeed possible to choose, quote unquote, good convention, such that the equilibrium state is stable, signals propagate slower than light, the equations are mathematically well posed, meaning they're strongly hyperbolic. Uh, they can be coupled to Einstein's equations of uh, general relativity. Um, you can put them on a computer and solve them, and um, indeed, uh, the, equation, the equations are good. But it comes at a, at a price. So, so far, the main thing to remember is that um, unifying Navier-Stokes with relativity was thought to be impossible for many decades. Uh, the lesson is if you just choose a physically sensible thermometer or velocimeter, then the Navier-Stokes equations happily unified with um, relativity and uh, numerical codes are now being developed by several research groups, uh, hopefully, hopefully with um, applications in mind such as astrophysics and um, um, subnuclear physics. Now, I'm going to start here as a footnote. So did it have to be this way? Maybe it didn't have to be this way. I don't know any deep reason why this, in fact, worked. So it could have happened that you try to adopt all possible conventions for your thermometers, velocimeters, and your equations are still not hyperbolic. So I don't know why there was a reason why it actually worked, if there is any, anything deep behind this. Um, so just to show one open question here. And the open question to me is uh, here, this question is the biggest question, the biggest sort of theoretical or fundamental question that underlies the foundation of all of relativistic uh, dissipative fluid dynamics. That is, uh, any theory of uh, sensible relativistic hydrodynamics seems to require that the equation contain non-hydrodynamic parameters. So what do I mean by non-hydrodynamic parameters? So what I mean is that if you choose your clever convention for temperature velocity, then the parameters of your thermometer or velocimeter, they enter into your equations. In addition to viscosity, heat conductivity, pressure, those things that are not universal, they're not specific to your fluid, they will enter in the equations. So in those exotic theories of fluid dynamics that people have proposed in the 1970s, it's even worse. You have, to throw away, throw, you have to throw in extra parameters into your equations, and you have to throw in extra variables, extra fields for which you have to pose you know, initial conditions into your equations. So there is no way, so, so in non-relativistic Navier-Stokes, you write down your equations and you, know, you specify your viscosity conductivity and you can solve them. In relativistic Navier-Stokes, it's not like that. You have to introduce other quote unquote junk into your equations. And therefore, it is in present unclear whether relativistic dissipative hydrodynamics, when formulated in terms of well-defined partial differential equations, can be made universal, quote unquote, or in the language of effective field theory, uh, independent uh, of the UV cutoff. So, uh, so the question that uh, I want to understand is uh, how does one quantify the dependence of the solutions on those, quote unquote, fake parameters? So you have partial differential equation, you have a parameter that actually ensures that your equation is hyperbolic. But you know that the parameter is not exactly very physical, but it's needed. It's like the ultraviolet cutoff in effective field theory. And so because your equations depend on that parameter, the solutions to your equation will also depend on that parameter. 
So how strongly do they depend on that parameter? For what kind of initial conditions? You can make some progress if the equations are linear, if the equations are fully nonlinear PDEs, it's hard to make progress. So what does this all mean? Um, I don't know much about PDE theory, but this is something that somebody who knows about PDE theory perhaps can help, um, can help uh, make progress in that field. Um, does relativistic dissipative hydrodynamics actually have predictive power for nonlinear evolution? So in the language of effective field theory, is it possible to remove the cutoff? If you're a field theorist, if you learn about field theory, people tell you that in order to make sense out of field theory, you have to do two things. First, you have to regularize, and then you have to renormalize. So in the context of uh, fluid dynamics, people know how to regularize, but people have no clue how to renormalize. Uh, so this is sort of uh, the, same, uh, the same question. If there is no way to remove the dependence of those unphysical parameters in the effective field theory, this means there is no universal formulation of, uh, non -relativist of a relativistic Navier-Stokes equation. And maybe we have to live with this. Maybe that's life. You know, some people would be unhappy, some people would be okay, but if this is life, this is life, like we don't tell nature what to do. Okay. So this was uh, the first part of my talk, uh, of three parts, now comes the second part. Are there limits to improving the hydrodynamic equations? <coughs> so let me take a first quick look at the limitations of hydrodynamics. So I'm going to say a very kind of trivial, <laughs> trivial thing is that underneath any macroscopic theory, there is a microscopic theory. Any macroscopic theory is fundamentally made of some kind of stuff, particles, fields, strings, whatnot. And um, typically there is some kind of microscopic distance scale associated to that microscopic degrees of freedom. And when we solve equations of fluid dynamics for temperature, velocity, particle density, whatnot, we find some solutions how these fields depend on distance. And there is going to be typical distance capital L of those solutions. And of course, hydrodynamics, you hope, is okay when capital L is much greater than little l, meaning the derivatives are small. Uh, and uh, if you solve the equations and you find solutions where the function, say, velocity, fluid velocity, varies on scales that are comparable to the microscopic distance scale, you say, okay, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, hydrodynamics is not supposed to work when the derivatives are large. So well, this, has this has motivated people to kind of postulate uh, the form of constitutive relations of, uh, in fluid dynamics as the sort of derivative expansion. So this uh, notion of derivative expansion has appeared in several talks already, in Michal's talk and Sasha's talk, I'm going to briefly comment uh, on, um, uh, on the expansion here. So what I mean is that you write your density and the flux which go into this uh, differential equation as sort of literally an expansion. So term with one derivative, term with two derivative, and you s sum those terms. It's literally a sum. And hopefully it works when the derivatives are, are small. So it's like a Taylor series, except it's not like a really a series. It's uh, this form of the constitutive relation. So if you only keep the first terms, this is what people call perfect fluid. Of course, this is the most imperfect model of fluids. Uh, cannot flow through a pipe. Sound propagates forever. Diffusion does not exist. Uh, if you keep up to one derivative, this is not Navier-Stokes fluids. It's an improvement of the imperfect perfect fluids. You introduce dissipation, restore common sense. Um, then you can talk about second order fluids and as an improvement of Navier-Stokes fluids and so on. So you can ask, can you keep improving forever? So let's say you generate this kind of series to all orders and derivatives. So does the series converge or does the series diverge? And if the series converges, then you can say, okay, I'm happy hydrodynamics can be systematically improved to include more and more transport phenomena. So transport coefficients beyond viscosity, some kind of second order coefficients, third order coefficients that are presumably measurable if you measure your uh, correlations in the fluid very precisely, or you measure sound, sound decay very precisely. And if the series diverges, well, there are really more questions than answers. Hydrodynamics is not supposed to work, but maybe it does. So in which sense it does? Is hydrodynamics a fluke? If it is not a fluke, why? Um, so what does this even mean to talk about convergence? Uh, when, you know, when I learned about convergence of a series in my first year mathematics classes, people write, you know, sum over n from one to infinity of like a sub n. <laughs> so what, what, what's that here? Um, so let's, let's try to be more precise here. So again, simplest possible setup, 
linearized perturbations of equilibrium. Let's look at plane waves, meaning take all fields to be proportional to this um, exponential. And then spatial derivatives is basically i times k. So the expansion in derivatives is the expansion in powers of k, which is uh, called the wave vector. Now, sometimes people call it momentum by mixing quantum and the classical language. So what is the quantity that I'm going to expand in powers of my wave vector? So the quantity that I'm going to expand is actually, it's, easily, it's easy to see what this quantity is going to be from here. So when I take a plane wave, so this time derivative will go in, is going to give one power of frequency. We have multiple powers of wave vector here. And so the physical question that is like a very reasonable physical question is to look at the expansion of frequency as a, in powers of the wave vector. So here is an example of what happens for sound waves. Sound waves has a piece that is linear in the wave vector coming from perfect fluids, Euler equations, uh, no dissipation, Vs is the speed of sound, plus minus because waves propagate you know, both ways. There's a complex thing proportional to k squared uh, with a coefficient capital gamma. Capital gamma is proportional to viscosity. There are actually two viscosities in fluids, so it's a combination of those viscosities. Uh, and then potentially there are um, terms with k cubed, k to the four, uh, and so on. So one question that is at least a well-posed question that you can ask is that does the series k plus k squared plus k cubed and so on, does the series converge or diverge in hydrodynamics? And one way to do it is just to compute these coefficients. And uh, well, here lies the trouble. The actual practical computation of what these coefficients are, I mean, it depends on the microscopic model of your fluid. I mean, you will find different answers for different fluids. That's one thing. And another thing is that in a relativistic system, the actual practical computation is quite technical and quite difficult. Even the reliable computation of the shear viscosity in simplest relativistic quantum field theory is a very uh, non-trivial and challenging exercise and like, writing down like a general expression for this coefficient is, um, is, is out of question. So, uh, but you can still hope that it works in some simple, simple examples. And um, there are simple examples. Uh, there's fluids that, uh, theoretical fluids, not, not fluids like water in this glass, uh, that can be studied analytically using methods of so-called holography. If you don't know what holography is, it's just uh, basically a trick that theoretical physicists have developed to study certain um, microscopic theories and figure out how macroscopic behavior works uh, in those models. And these fluids, they're morally speaking similar to subnuclear matter. They're morally speaking similar to the quark-gluon plasma that people produce in nuclear collisions. And Okay, so we look at the simplest examples of those holographic fluids, uh, and we find that, um, you know, we did this exercise, we found that uh, sound waves uh, as a function of wave vector is actually a convergent function of k. It's convergent for some critical value of the wave vector given by this formula. It's quite nice, you know, temperature, Planck's constant, speed of light, two pi squared of two, what not. And okay, so this is also something that Sasha was talking about because see, Sasha is um, my collaborator here, and gives you hope that hydrodynamics is improvable. Uh, so why is there convergence? Uh, why is there a critical value? And here is an example that you know, we teach students in, uh, when we teach about complex analysis, you say, well, let's look at this function, one divided by one plus x squared, and this function is a perfectly smooth function of x. Uh, but uh, the Taylor series for this function only converges when absolute value of x is less than one. So why is that? There is no singularity anywhere in this graph. And to understand why you take x complex and then there is singularity in the plane of complex x. So the same actually happens here. Frequency as a function of the wave vector or frequency as a function of wavelengths is a smooth function for all real wavelengths. Uh, to understand why there is convergence, uh, you need to take wavelengths complex. So what does it mean? What does it mean to talk about complex frequency and momentum? So in classical phys physics, the relations between frequency and momentum, people call them dispersion relations, they come about by solving some equation, some function of frequency and k squared is equal to zero. It's k squared because of rotation invariance, more generally it's omega and k. And this function f is determined by your uh, microscopic theory or by your effective description. Uh, it can come from hydrodynamics, it can come from Maxwell's equations and matter, it can come from some, some other uh, theory that you, that you want to work with.
So here is a simple example of the diffusion equation. Diffusion equation has one space, one time derivative, two space derivatives, and uh, upon the substitution of this plane wave, you get capital F, so that's this function. You solve equation capital F is equal to zero, you find the relationship between omega and k squared. Okay, for, for sound waves, the equation is slightly more complicated. This is sound waves in Navier-Stokes, in linearized Navier-Stokes, speed of sound, damping, coefficient of sound wave, whatnot. So, but more generally, this function can be, can be quite, quite uh, complicated function. So what is the meaning here? What is the physical interpretation? So if you take omega, the frequency, to be a real number, you solve this equation, and it turns out uh, when you find k as a function of omega, there are no real solution. In general, k as a function of omega is complex. So what does this mean? Uh, the imaginary part of k you interpret as the damping length or the penetration depth of the fluid as it, or of the wave as it propagates inside your material. So it tells you how far the wave can propagate inside your fluid. On the other hand, you, if you take k real, then you can only solve this equation when frequency is complex. And then the imaginary part of frequency will tell about the relaxation time, uh, how long it takes for your wave to decay uh, to, to equilibrium. So this is what we normally teach uh, physics students when we talk about uh, waves and complex representation of waves. Uh, but what if both omega and k are complex? <laughs> so we normally don't teach them <laughs> to physics students. And it's not exactly clear what, what the physical interpretation is if both frequency and momentum are complex, but you can take them to be complex and see what happens. Um, so here is an example of uh, what uh, happens in those exactly solvable, uh, those exactly solvable models from the so-called holography. Um, so these are oscillation modes of a fluid at real momentum. So what is it that you are looking at? So I have some equation that comes from the microscopic property of my fluid, and I know how to, how to, how to analyze this equation. And I take this k to be a real number. I solve this equation, I find solutions for frequency. Frequency is complex. There is going to be, for this part, in this particular example, there's going to be infinitely many solutions, and each solution is marked by a dot in this complex plane. The color is just to differentiate different solutions. Um, so normalization in terms of temperature, Boltzmann constant, Planck constant, whatnot. Real part of frequency, imaginary part of frequency. Okay, so, so it's clear what, what this picture shows. Um, okay. So what, what, what are these dots? So the dots that are closest to the origin are the sound waves. When frequency is plus minus Vs times K minus uh, the dissipation. So the real part here when uh, uh, K is small will tell about the speed of sound. The imaginary part of here, the imaginary part here will tell about the dissipation of sound. Uh, so these are macroscopic classical excitations of the fluid. This is the stuff that you can describe using partial differential equations. And these dots, the, the orange dot and the blue dot, they approach the origin as you take k to zero. Now, what about these other dots? Well, the other dots are the microscopic oscillation modes. They have no classical interpretation. You cannot describe them by any fluid mechanical equations. Uh, think about them, you know, if you think about your fluid as some kind of made of particles, so think about them as, you know, particle-like excitations not macroscopic excitation. This really microscopic stuff that you do not have access to when you use this effective description in terms of velocity, temperature, particle density, whatnot. Uh, and they stay away from the origin as uh, k uh, goes to zero. So this is what happens when the wavelength is a real number, frequency is complex. Now, I want to explore what happens if I take my wavelengths to be complex as well. So what's going to happen here, I'm going to take my wave vector. So Q is the normalized wave vector, normalized by temperature. Uh, and I'm going to give it a phase. I'm going to say, okay, here it's one in these particular units times exponential I theta. And I'm going to change theta from zero to two pi. So what happens to these solutions as theta changes from zero to two pi? So what happens is that as theta changes, they move. So they come back to them, come back, okay? So the whole picture has to, the set of modes has to come back to exactly the same set of modes at zero and two pi, of course, but they may swap places. Uh, so these two, they have swapped places, but they remain sound waves. 
So now if you take the momentum of the wave vector to zero, they will still approach the origin. Basically sound waves remain sound waves. And the swap places because uh, I'm changing here the phase of uh, uh, momentum of the wave vector squared rather than the phase of K. Uh, so now I want to see what happens if I increase the value of my wave vector in units of temperature. So here uh, is uh, the, uh, the, way the value of the wave vector is 1.99 in units of temperature. I'm going to make it complex. I'm going to change the phase from zero to two pi. And uh, that's what happens as the phase uniformly goes from zero to two pi. So again, the sound modes, the blue and the gold, they swap places, they remain sound modes. Now you take the wave vector to zero, they will again approach the origin. Remember the wave vector going to zero is the limit of hydrodynamics, is the limit that you can describe using partial differential equations. Um, now this was when the wave, wave vector is 1.99 in units of temperature. Now I'm going to take it to be 2.01 in units of temperature. And as the phase goes from zero to two pi, so that uniformly, so that is what happens to those solutions. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is that uh, the blue and the orange, they were sound waves. But now sound wave now became one of the non-classical modes. Now you take momentum to zero, this uh, blue and this green will approach the origin, and this one will stay at a finite distance away from the origin. So, um, what used to be a classical mode described by, by your partial differential equations became a microscopic mode uh, that, is, that is not uh, accessible in the, in the macroscopic theory. And so what happens, of course, is that in between something, something happens, and in between you have a collision of uh, singularities, and the topology of these trajectories changes in the complex plane. So this is level crossing in a macroscopic dissipative system. Um, you maybe have heard about level crossing in quantum mechanics. So this is analogous to that. This is level crossing, but not in a quantum mechanics, not in quantum mechanics, but in a macroscopic dissipative system when a classical excitation has become a non-classical excitation. And by classical, non-classical, by non-classical, I don't mean quantum. By non-classical, I mean something that you do not have access to in the language of hydrodynamics. <coughs> And uh, this collision is what determines the convergence of the expansion, what gives the critical wavelengths for sound in those particular models. Um, so the main thing to remember is that uh, in many soluble examples, these classical microscopic excitations, uh, non-classical microscopic excitations, they're merely different branches of the same multivalued complex function. So for more details about this, Sasha gave a very detailed talk about this uh, at this workshop. So a lot of his talk was about more technical details about this simple physical phenomena, but I hope the simple, the simple phenomena is, is, is clear here without, without much uh, technical details. Um, so here is an open question. So all this convergent business and movement of modes uh, and you know, this, uh, complex spectral curves, uh, all of this uh, was just for linearized perturbations of equilibrium. So since I talked about the derivative expansion, you can ask yourself, well, how do you write down the hydrodynamic equations which, well, take this into account, say you want to improve your Navier-Stokes to third order in derivatives, and at the same time you get nonlinear partial differential equations that are in fact consistent with relativity. And the answer is nobody knows. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe people have not tried hard enough Maybe people will do this at some point, but at this point, uh, I will list this um, as an open question. So my final story is going to be why everything I said so far is wrong. Um, <clears throat> and now I want to take a second look at the limitations of hydrodynamics. And I'm going to make the same trivial sounding statement that macroscopic stuff is made out of microscopic stuff. Uh, and if you think about an analogy with uh, quantum theory, then in a quantum vacuum, you have virtual particles that are constantly produced and absorbed due to quantum fluctuations. This is maybe hard to visualize, but something similar happens in a, in a statistical system, even in a gas of billiard balls, in a gas of classical particles. Uh, in a macroscopic state, virtual sound waves are constantly produced and absorbed due to statistical fluctuations. The sound waves will back react on the macroscopic physics because hydrodynamics is nonlinear and waves interact. So here is a cartoon. Uh, so this is thick line is a solution of your 
uh, fluid mechanical equations and underline this as some kind of particle-like picture. Statistical fluctuations will generate sound waves. The sound waves will propagate out and the statistically generated sound waves will interact with the thick sound wave because you have a nonlinear theory. <coughs> so is this even relevant? So back reaction sometimes can be very, very relevant. So using analogy with quantum mechanics, so the back reaction of quantum fluctuations is actually responsible for most of the mass of the matter we see in the universe. So the reason why stuff has mass is because of the back reaction of quantum fluctuation and essentially there was Nobel Prize in 2004 awarded for that to gross field second policy. <coughs> uh, um, now the back reaction of statistical fluctuations is usually not so dramatic, but it does modify Navier-Stokes equations uh, near liquid gas critical points and uh, in two dimensions. And uh, all of these statements are not specific to a fluid being relativistic normal non-relativistic Galilean fluids, they will have all of, the same, all of the same issues. So should you really care about this back reaction stuff in fluids? <laughs> well, it really depends on the questions that you ask. Uh, so the relation of hydrodynamics to statistical physics is like the relation of classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. And you know that if you look at correlations, then classical versus quantum predictions can differ quite dramatically. And something sort of similar happens even if you don't have any quantum interference or entanglement, even in statistical physics, when you're interested in macroscopic, long time, long distance correlations, then classical hydro equations, which ignore the back reactions, can give rise to predictions that are, um, uh, that are incorrect. So for normal fluids, um, what this means is that if you want to understand correlations in a the fluid, then hydrodynamics, you should not be thinking of hydrodynamics as partial differential equations. This will not give you right answers. So things like the power series of frequency is a power series in the wave vector. All of the things will, will not work. There will be other singularities, uh, you know, very all kinds of branch cuts, logarithms, whatnot. Um, uh, normally, macroscopic correlations are determined by transport coefficients, viscosity, say how energy is correlated in the fluid depends by how far the sound propagates. So this determine, is determined by the viscosity. But this actually will not be true anymore once you start taking this back reaction effects uh, uh, seriously. So incompleteness, this incompleteness of classical hydrodynamics has been well known uh, in statistical physics going back to 70s, actually early, uh, late 1960s when people started doing first simulations in molecular dynamics uh, with, with first computers. And um, there's a way to address those questions and the way to address those questions is to recast hydrodynamics in a language uh, similar to, uh, to, quantum, uh, to quantum field theory. So let me look at a simple example to just, just give you like a little bit of taste of, of, of what this is. Um, let's think about viscosity. So what is viscosity? Viscosity is a measure of internal friction in a fluid. So let's think about you know, fluid, which is a gas. Uh, so why does internal friction happen? So here's a picture of my fluid going from uh, right to left. So the fluid moves fast. Uh, at the bottom, the fluid moves slower on top. And um, these uh, blue arrows are the particles. So your fluid is fundamentally made out of particles and the particles move within the fluid. So if you have a particle that moves from a fast moving layer at the bottom and it goes up, it can speed up the slower moving layer uh, on top. And this is the equilibration mechanism between different uh, uh, velocities um, uh, in, um, uh, in a gas here. So viscosity shows up uh, when you express stress uh, as a, in terms of derivatives uh, of the velocity and it can be related to correlations of stress, say x, y components of stress can be uh, expressed as you know, something that comes from zero derivative fluid dynamics which is pressure, uh, I times the frequency times the viscosity, so the same viscosity that measures the equilibration rate um, uh, in, uh, in momentum. And because uh, because uh, uh, it's more efficient to transfer momentum if you travel for longer, the viscosity in a gas will be proportional to the mean distance traveled by the particles. So people call this mean free path. Well, there are some prefactors, density, mean velocity, but the important thing is that the viscosity is proportional to the mean distance that is traveled by the particles in a gas. So um, 
Now, momentum cannot be just transferred by particles, it can also be transferred by collective excitations. So if you have, say, a sound wave that has been generated here by statistical fluctuation, it propagates in the fluid, and it can also contribute to the equilibration of momentum. Uh, if you think about gas of sound waves, so how far does the sound wave propagate? Well, how far it propagates is inversely proportional uh, to the viscosity. There are some prefactors that I have stuck here, energy plus pressure for relativistic fluid. There will be like mass density in a non-relativistic fluid. It's not super important. The important thing, it's inversely proportional to viscosity, and it's uh, inversely proportional to the wave vector squared. This essentially comes from those linearized dispersion relations for sound waves. Uh, this just tells you that low frequency waves uh, in the ocean propagate for longer distances than uh, high frequency waves. So that's why you know whales use low frequency um, acoustics rather than high frequency acoustics because it propagates for longer. <coughs> so if you want to take into account the contribution of all those waves to viscosity, you have to sum over all possible values of this wave vector. So you do this integral in D space dimensions. I have stuck in some factors for dimensional reasons. They're not that important. Uh, the important thing is D dimensional spatial integral, one over viscosity here and one over K squared here. In three space dimensions, this integral is linearly divergent at large K. And uh, then you say, okay, I need to understand what this is. But in two space dimensions, it's even worse because it's divergent at small k. And when you have divergence at small wave vector, this means you have divergence at large distances, which means you don't necessarily understand what you're doing uh, physically. Uh, and, um, well, there is some mathematical formalism to, to deal with those effects. And here is an example of um, the leading order contribution due to those effects to correlations of stress. So formally speaking, this is a two-point correlation function of stress, a zero wave vector. That's why there is no K. Wave vector is zero. Frequency is not zero. Um, the terms that are marked in red are the terms that come from classical fluid dynamics, classical partial differential equations. Uh, pressure from zeroth order, no derivatives. I times omega, one derivative with respect to time, so that's your viscosity from first order hydrodynamics, not just Stokes. Then there's going to be two derivatives, uh, from second order classical hydrodynamics and so on. The terms marked in purple are the leading order statistical corrections. And there is a correction to pressure. You know, if you are a relativistic field theorist, think about it as a renormalization of cosmological constant. So that's quite boring uh, or maybe interesting. Um, uh, renormalization of viscosity due to a linear diversion term. Uh, um, so these, 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 you can say, are not very interesting because they, they, they are cutoff dependent. So you can absorb them into renormalized pressure and viscosity. But this one is interesting because this is cutoff independent. So this is a finite answer. It has only depends on like roots of twos and pi's and the pressure and temperature and viscosity and the frequency. So and the thing is, it's um, uh, it's more important than the two derivative to derivative classical term. Okay, so fluctuations are more important than second order hydrodynamics, and uh, these infrared contributions are determined by thermodynamics and viscosity over entropy. Now, the interesting thing is what happens when you Fourier transform to real time, okay? You can say, okay, when frequency is small, maybe this is less important than omega squared, and this is true, but uh, small frequency is not the same as late times, so this is a non-analytic function of frequency. So when you Fourier transform in time, you will get a power law behavior. So in real time, your correlations of stress, and more generally, you will have correlations of fluxes, uh, correlations of velocities, uh, they will decay as a power law. And uh, what this tells you is that the leading late time behavior is non-classical. This is, again, sort of not that dissimilar from what happens in, um, in the quantum field theory, that uh, non-abelian gauge theory where the leading long distance behavior is again non-classical, so the one loop effect gives you the running of the coupling constant, dimensional transmutation, whatnot. Uh, now in two space dimensions, well, you get the logarithm. So if you want to write down some kind of microscopic expression for the viscosity, if you want to calculate viscosity microscopically, you will not be able to get a finite answer. At most, you will be able to get a logarithm of frequency and uh, you cannot take the frequency all the way to zero. 
And another thing is that if you want to understand this in the language of so-called holography that I mentioned, then holography is not very useful in this particular, for these particular effects because holography is a set of toy models that um, uh, go by names as large n theories, this kind of large n limit, and large n limit does not commute uh, with the hydrodynamic limit. Um, all right, so there is uh, a simple analogy with uh, quantum gravity. I probably will skip it. Uh, yeah, you can ask me about it later if you want to. Um, uh, so the bottom line is uh, that uh, using classical theory, and by classical, I mean partial differential equations, if you want to use classical theory to, un to evaluate the response to infrared sources, uh, that's, that's not reliable. So by what I mean by response to infrared sources, because that's what correlations are. Correlation is a response to an external source. Uh, um, and uh, short time statistical fluctuations, they give rise to late time correlations. And essentially this happens because you have quote unquote massless modes uh, in the game, massless, gapless. Anytime you have uh, massless or gapless modes, uh, you will have uh, infrared correlations. Now, in fact, the problems of classical theory do not end here, especially if you want to do the derivative expansion. Uh, and uh, if you want to go beyond vanilla statistical physics, or as I was talking about earlier, well, there's a few questions. Um, so these fluctuation effects are normally described by some kind of noise, microscopic noise. So you talk, start talking about stochastic differential equations, then you can convert the stochastic differential equations into a path integral if you want to. And the noise is normally taken to be Gaussian um, by some version of the central limit theorem. But the Gaussian noise is only there when the wavelength is very large because that's when, um, that's when the central lim limit theorem applies. And once you want to shrink the wavelengths, meaning you want to, beyond, you want to go beyond the k goes to zero limit, meaning you want to do the derivative expansion, your noise is not going to be Gaussian anymore. Uh, so you have to deal with that. Uh, you will have to deal with uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem, not just for two-point functions, but for all endpoint functions. You will have to talk about like non-retorted, symmetric functions, all of those things that normally you cannot measure classically, but they contain the low energy information. And um, there's a whole lot of questions about, uh, uh, about low energy physics that is not accessible to to differential equations amended by, uh, by uh, stochastic Gaussian forces. So if you like kinetic theory, uh, this, is, this is sort of the picture that you want to have in mind. So what you need is you need an actual, actual effective field theory. And by field theory, I mean something that has an action, has a path integral, has a set of symmetries, fundamental fields that you know what they are. You know the measure for those fields. You can perform a path integral over those fields and compute, compute uh, the physical observables, such as density, density, correlations in a fluid. Um, so if you like an analogy with kinetic theory, so here is a kind of cartoon when I, where I have two axes, one is frequency and one is interactions or density. So kinetic theory applies when the interactions are weak or the density is small, but the frequency is not necessarily arbitrarily small. So that's the regime of kinetic theory. And the effective theory that I, that I want uh, is the effective theory that applies when the interactions can be large or small, density can be large or small, but the frequency only can be very, very, very small. Okay, there is some, some overlap region uh, between. Um, so the claim is uh, such an EFT can indeed be constructed. People have started working on it since 1970s, but by now, uh, there are much more sophisticated version of this that can take into account all of these subtle physical effects that I, that I briefly mentioned. Uh, this effective field theory describes uh, real-time physics, uh, both in and out of equilibrium, and um, it can give rise to interest, and in, you can describe interest in physical effects, such as uh, you can find um, that measurable correlation functions receive inter infrared contributions from things that you can never ever see if you look at classical equations of motion. So you have stuff that's invisible to any classical equations of motion to any order in the derivative expansion, but that stuff still contributes to long distance correlations. Um, so open question. Since I now have a field theory, you can ask any question you want <laughs> in quantum field theory, you can ask this in, in these uh, statistical setups. Um, so basically, I'm concluding now. 
So the things to remember from this talk are, are these. Uh, relativistic fluid dynamics probably does not exist as a universal lower energy classical theory, unlike Galilean hydrodynamics. And that is because you need a UV cutoff and you don't necessarily know how to get rid of this cutoff. This cutoff is this non-hydrodynamic parameters, parameters of the thermometers, parameters of these extra fields that you introduce to make your theory consistent with relativity. Uh, measurable correlation functions such as stress-stress or flux-flux or density-density correlation functions, they can be computed in classical theory uh, in equilibrium, actually outside of equilibrium as well. Uh, these are cutoff independent, but they're not always reliable when you go beyond leading order in uh, derivatives. You can amend your theory to take uh, these effects into account by Gaussian noises, but Gaussian noises don't tell the full story. If you want the full story, you need the full-blown uh, effective field theory. And so that's good news, uh, is that now there is an effective field theory. It can be used to compute all the correlations uh, that you like. Uh, in equilibrium and out of equilibrium. And the theory is sort of new. It's people have started talking about this actively maybe six, seven years ago. And it sort of sits there underexplored uh, and uh, it can still be used to answer other more sophisticated questions. So with that, so thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Pavel. So to model this Gaussian noise that you were talking about, are you aware of any approaches that uh, involve stochastic differential equations? Well, th that's the thing. So the simplest, the simplest, uh, the simplest um, sort of way to solve these problems is indeed uh, to use stochastic differential equations with Gaussian noises. And if your noise is Gaussian, that's, that's indeed the effect. This, this is the picture that essentially comes from, this formula essentially comes from the stochastic differential equation with, uh, with, uh, with the Gaussian noise. Now, stochastic differential equations, like not, not as a field theory, but as stochastic differential equations, um, I, I don't understand them very well. I have better intuition about, uh, about field theory and stochastic differential equations you can convert uh, into a field theory. But once you have stochastic differential equations with multiplicative noise, it can get sort of technically, technically messy. <laughs> and I don't want to think uh, about those messy things. I would rather substitute those messy things for cutoff dependence in um, effective field theory for which I have, um, I have um, better intuition. But the question that you asked. Is there actually yeah. an equivalence? Because for there's, there are, so yes, there yes. are, I know, I know of approaches that use quantum field theory mm -hmm. uh, methods too. Oh, that's right. So they're perfectly, they're, those approaches are perfectly equivalent? Uh, well, I wouldn't make like a general statement that this is, this is always equivalent. I mean, okay. in some examples, yes. In some examples, they're equivalent. Are they equivalent like in, like in full generality? I, I, I okay. like I'm not qualified really to answer this question. But, but really, the thing that is like, like happening there physically is that you do have these microscopic noises. These noises can be Gauss and non-Gauss, and you, can, you have to implement derivative expansions for those noises. But then another important thing is that when you write down stochastic differential equations, I mean, you have to say what the noise does. And the property of the noise, so if you ask a question about what happens in equilibrium, so you have stuff that sits there in equilibrium and you want to measure the density-density correlation function of your fluid, in equilibrium, okay, so how density is correlated. Uh, you have to make sure that the property of the noise is such that it reflects the fact that you are in equilibrium and not in some other state. <laughs> and it's quite non-trivial to implement. It's easy to implement if the noise is Gaussian. So if the noise is Gaussian, then making sure that the noise correlations are such that you respect, well, technically it's called KMS condition in equilibrium, uh, is not an easy thing to do. And hopefully in this effective field theories, it's an easier, it's an easier way to implement uh, uh, the statement that you know that you are working with an equilibrium state. It's easier to do it in the language of field theory than it is in the language of um, stochastic differential equations. So that's, that, that's why I like it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
So in classical rational mechanics, the two key steps in writing down constitutive rules are frame invariance and entropy inequality. So, so it, is that implicit in the things you've said? I didn't see them. Did you say 2D CFT? No, classical rational mechanics. I'm an applied mathematician, not a mm -hmm. quantum person. So, so the question is about, say, the entropy production. Is the entropy production? Yeah, and frame invariance as well. So respecting the symmetries. Um, by frames, so, so, so could you clarify what you mean by frames? Because there are different people mean different things when they... So just ro the rotation and translation invariance and stuff, Galilean invariance. Uh, yes, yes. So the equations are written in a way, uh, of course, that respect, that have to respect whatever symmetry that uh, you want to have in your microscopic theory. So if your microscopic theory is a Galilean invariant microscopic theory, then the equations of fluid mechanics will be Galilean covariant equations, and they will be such that within the framework of those fluid mechanical equations, there exists a local notion of entropy, uh, the entropy current that whose divergence is positive semi-definite, reflecting you know, the increase of entropy outside of thermal equilibrium. So the same is true in, uh, in uh, relativistic, uh, in, uh, relativistic uh, fluid dynamics. You have to write on equations in a way that are relativistically covariant, that transform you know, properly under you know, Lorentz transformations, under diffeomorphisms, and uh, uh, moreover, what, what, what's, what's important is that uh, uh, the equations have to be hyperbolic. <coughs> And they have to be hyperbolic, they have to admit a well-defined initial value formulation, and within those, uh, within those um, uh, theories, there will be a notion of the entropy current, uh, which is a local function of the hydrodynamic fields, the derivatives of the hydrodynamic fields, this entropy current will have a divergence that is positive semi-definite. And the important thing is that when we talk about entropy production, uh, the entropy production has to be positive within the domain of validity of the theory. Okay, just thank like, you, thank you. Yeah, just like hydrodynamics is written as an expansion, so at short distances, you don't expect hydrodynamic uh, you know, equations to be valid, just like for the entropy production, so the divergence of that entropy current doesn't have necessarily to be positive semi-definite once you start looking at short distance, uh, short distance solutions. All right, uh, we should move on to the next talk. Let's thank Pavel again. Thank you very much.